really proud of it. The, um, the theme, um, Luis Aira Inc. actually plays a bit of a, a role on, on the things that we're going to explore. This was one of those uh, institutions started by the grassroots movement of the 70s that, um, and it went through hard times like a lot of other institutions. Uh, and, but it, it is a victory that we're still here. We only reopened two years ago. Um, so it's like it was a big player as a community development organization and our mission has evolved with the times to be more uh, about including that sense of place and belonging that uh, not only the Latino footprint in this neighborhood um, deserves because of all the contributions that they've done to the neighborhood, but you know, supplementing the storyline, the mainstream storylines that get told and don't get told, <laughs> don't, don't get told. So, you know, we're, it, this is one of those victories. We're gonna see case studies of different things that happen to, um, to our built environment and how community plays a role. And we're, you know, at least the uh, happy part of the story is that Luis Aida Inc. managed to survive the, the difficult years and uh, open two years ago with a 51 year old lease. Um, to put for uh, thanks to uh, unanimous community support. Um, so welcome again. I, I invite you to learn more about our programs that are very diverse. Our website is loisida.org. Um, we are the producers of the legendary Loisida Festival. That's this year. It's going to be its thirtieth. Um, and uh, I want to present Mr. Harry Bobbins, who was the brain behind this event. I'm with the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation, and uh, we're honored to be partnering with the Lowysida Center. I, specifically, despite our name, uh, work on matters regarding the East Village and Lower East Side, and so uh, I'm very excited to be drawing a spotlight on some of the valuable community resources that inspired me decades ago to get involved in the work that I'm involved with, which I'll talk about briefly. Um, so Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation is a membership organization dedicated to the cultural and architectural preservation of the Greenwich Village, NoHo, and East Village area. And we're very thankful to be partnering tonight with Historic Districts Council. And Simeon Bankoff will be moderating a Q&A at the end of all the presentations. So please save your uh, wonderful questions and Simeon will help spark a discussion afterwards. We're also partnering with East Village Community Coalition that's been doing a lot of work around PS64, the charts that we will be hearing about, and the Lower East Side Preservation Mission as well that's been very important uh, contributors to uh, preserving the integrity of our neighborhood. And we're very thankful to have people taking the time out of their busy lives and days to talk about the examples of the tale of four schools today. Um, we have residents of a building that was designed by CBJ Snyder, who we will hear more at length about from Professor and Historian Jean Arrington to start off the evening. And then once she gives an overview of his uh, prolific designs that revolutionized public education, we will learn about four different buildings in four different communities, a tale of four schools. One of them tragically is gone, Two of them are functioning in a manner that serves the community in one vision or another. And then there's one a few blocks away from here that is um, ready to be utilized um, with all of our efforts. So tonight we, we are honored to have, uh, well he's not here right now, so I'll wait. Um, we have a little change in our schedule, which our program right here. Edwin Torres is a photographer with the New York Times from the Bronx. Um, he, uh, we have his slides. I will present them. I'm from the Bronx. I know the building. I was involved in trying to preserve it. He was called to assignment to some of the things that are going on with the police down south to cover that. So he expresses his regrets for not being here today. But we have some of his wonderful um, impressionistic images of what was there. We have representatives from Datner Architects. Joseph Coppola is here. And from Monomic Developers, Tom Ciano who have transformed PS 186 in West Harlem, and you will be astounded by what's possible from ruins um, that they've transformed. 
We have residents from PS109, El Barrio Art Space, Edwin Colazo and Sybil Brun, who will talk about, they live in one of these buildings that was empty. What is it like? How, how did it happen? Um, and then we have, uh, we're honored to have Chino Garcia here, one of the founders of Charas, who um, had the courage with his colleagues to go into an empty building and lead a, 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 a radical approach to community planning. And Libertad Gira, who you just heard from, from the Low East Side Center, will be sharing with him. So um, I think that covers up our thanks. Our phones are off, um, and you know where the bathroom is. So without further ado, I will introduce Jean Arrington to tell us more about CBJ Snyder. Huge windows that brought in ample light and air. 
He provided such modern amenities as mechanical ventilation systems, individual student desks, and heated cloakrooms. By designing them himself and putting them out for bids, since purchasing name brand equipment for the largest public school system in the country was prohibitively expensive. Snyder schools also represented a revolution in functionality. <coughs> While earlier schools had consisted basically of uniform classrooms in which academic <coughs> subjects were taught by rote, he added diversified spaces that supported the broadened, more relevant, and hands-on curriculum advocated by progressive <coughs> educators like John Dewey. An article in the Real Estate Record and Guide includes this statement. His success as a designer is largely due to his readiness to accept suggestions from the teaching staff. <laughs> Teachers and principals were advocating for spaces such as auditoriums, manual training rooms, <coughs> subjects like carpentry, toy making, printing, cooking, and sewing, roof playgrounds, gymnasiums, art studios, music rooms, and science laboratories, all of which and more Snyder delivered. He transformed the 19th century school building, uh, school, sorry, the 19th century school house into the 20th century school building in the process creating what we know and expect from the school today. Snyder transformed the look of public schools as well, from buildings with little to distinguish them from the surrounding urban fabric, including on the right, the former PS36 uh, in which we are sitting, in which we are sitting, uh, he transformed that to buildings that drew attention to themselves, that proclaimed the worthiness of education and of individual students. He does that which no other architect before his time ever did or tried. He builds them beautiful, said Jacob Rees. He found barracks where he is leaving palaces to the people. In his first decade on the job, the 1890s, Often simultaneously and within blocks of one another, Snyder built schools that illustrated the two major Western architectural traditions, flamboyant, Gothic, and elegant Italian palazzo. The extravagant PS27 is just across St. Mary's Park from the elegant uh, Italian, uh, from, from the decorous Italian palazzo style PS25, both opened in 1898. A year later opened the Gothic PS160, just a few blocks down Rivington Street from the Italian palazzo style PS20, which today stands empty and threatened. The AIDS facility, facility that it occupied it for the past many years having just moved out. In 1900, he also introduced the collegiate Gothic style, daring to put elementary students in buildings with overtones of Oxford and Cambridge. On the bottom left is a 1908 picture of the landmark PS31. On the right, the building after having been empty for 20 years, a condition that led to this. Mm -hmm. Snyder introduced another, not only not new look, but whole new type of building, one that became a New York City phenomenon, the H-Plan building. Located mid-block with courtyards opening onto each side street, H-Plan schools guaranteed light and air for every classroom. This earliest extant H-Plan, PS165, had patriotic stars and stripes in its 22 ornate pediments. In the first decade of Snyder's career, or if the first decade of Snyder's career involved extraordinary creativity, the second was marked by sheer volume and size. 
Uh, after the 1898 consolidation of the boroughs as the now second largest city in the world in need of a world-class public school system, New York tripled funding to the schools. Snyder was now in charge of more than double his original purview and was running one of the early large-scale architectural offices with, with a staff of 400 by the time he retired. He was now working with William Henry Maxwell, the first superintendent of schools for Greater New York. About their relationship, a 1903 writer said, once Maxwell has de devised the curriculum, a call is sent to Mr. Snyder to build a home for the school. This he does, fashioning it carefully to meet pedagogic requirements. A year or so, so later, the school begins housekeeping. As for the style of the, his second decade schools, he depended more and more on standardization. More than half of the schools had an institutional Italianate look with cornices, coins, and elaborate window treatments, particularly lush and ornate at the beginning of the decade. Snyder's, dec uh, Snyder's second decade represents also the heyday of the H Plan School, which went through several stylistic phases. Other Loire Valley Chateau type H Plans, like PS 165, included PS 109, uh, yeah, PS 179, the last H Plan to have been demolished and replaced with mm -hmm. the school on the right. Yeah. Uh, and PS 170, which located just north of the Harlem Mere in Central Park, could overlook the park and be a grand sight from the park. And here is its replacement. Mm -hmm. yeah. wow. <laughs> PS 186 in Harlem, representing the Italian palazzo phase, sat derelict for 40 years, Minerva, nonetheless, presiding over 145th Street, while trees grew out of the roof. There's also two blocks to the west, the French Renaissance PS64. Uh, in this decade, Snyder did most of his total of 52 eight plan buildings, 40 of which still stand. His second decade also brought about public high schools for the city. He relied on his experience uh, with elementary schools, the H Plan becoming the prototype for Manhattan's first high school, Wadley for High School for Girls, with a 125-foot asymmetrical tower. In 1906, the H Plan DeWitt Clinton High School for Boys opened, <laughs> pictured here in a four part article Snyder wrote for uh, American Architect and Building News. It was his experience with collegiate Gothic elementary schools that led to what many consider his masterpiece, Morris High School, landmarked inside and out all had spectacular auditoriums. By the end of his career, he had provided New York with 26 high schools, including such iconic buildings as, buildings as the Old Stuyvesant, Erasmus, Newtown, and Flushing High Schools. All 26 still function as schools, except one that was demolished for Lincoln Center. Snyder's final decade in that initiated a radical stylistic change if Italian aid was out, 80% of his third decade new schools were in the more streamlined, simplified Gothic style. Mm -hmm. Buildings of three to nine bays with Tudor arches over the top floor windows, a crenellated roof line instead of an overhanging cornice, and a two-story medieval looking entrance way. Particularly in the outer boroughs, simplified Gothic was pervasive. Snyder's story doesn't have a completely happy ending. His final decade was a stormy, dark period for the country as a whole with the 1910 recession and World War I. And for Snyder himself, his collaborator, William Maxwell, died 
uh, Snyder's own buildings in a highly publicized investigation were criticized for the very issues about which he had felt most deeply. Hmm. And Mayor John Hyland, to fulfill a second term campaign promise of a seat for every child, wanted an architect who would sacrifice quality for speed. Ever gracious, Snyder retired, saying he hadn't had a vacation in 18 years, that he was tired and wanted to go fishing. <laughs> this unassuming man standing here with his wife. You know what happened there, uh, there was a campaign to save it, and unfortunately was not successful. And so we just heard about the, the overarching uh, wonders of education that were to uh, inspire the students that go into these buildings. And as we learn quickly and see from this sad tale, it's not uh, a sure thing that history or our culture will value these things. And it's imperative that we stay engaged to, as you'll hear from uh, an architect development team, uh, that in one example have, that we'll learn tonight preserved it. So Edwin, like I said, he's down south on assignment. So this was PS31 on Grand Concourse, named after the abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison. I'm going to breeze through it. His was more impressionistic, and I know I want to hear from the rest of the folks. Over there near, you know, just south of the courthouse, right by Hostos College. Um, let's have a look. You saw some pictures before, and it was actually a high-performing school at the time of the 90s when uh, Mr. Giuliani closed it. It was landmarked in 1986, it was an actual landmark um, with uh, highlighted no witnesses in opposition to the designation um, in 1986. And then it went into disrepair, it was shut down like Giuliani did many things uh, back in the day. And uh, Edwin, a photographer who's doing a series in this called Murder in the 4-0, the 40th precinct in the South Bronx, went into, because he was astounded that this was happening in our community, that the powers that be could just let this thing uh, rot in uh, demolition by neglect. The New York Landmarks Conservancy called it a municipal disgrace. Um, the initial repairs could have been straightforward. There was $50 million to restore it. And the plan was defunded and never executed. Um, so it wasn't just local advocates fighting vociferously, former students. It was, you know, the preservation community across the city was astounded at what occurred. Um, you know, paperwork just left behind. That's a school authority study or something. They were, you know, just left it behind in this building. And it, it had been open to the elements for over a decade um, when it was shut down. and. Little, little by little, it kept rotting. Um, there was even a plan, even groups like Sobro, who aren't necessarily the most community-minded, had a plan, they collaborated with ArtSpace to come up with a vision, who subsequently did PS109, and as the head of Sobro said, we've renovated buildings in much worse condition. And unfortunately, the political clout, for whatever reason, was not there, but the, to say that it was not salvageable or repairable, uh, was not true. And we'll see from other examples upcoming that a lot can be done even in something that looks like this or with trees coming out the window. They left so fast they even left their Air Jordans. <laughs> <laughs> so from all that investment, in, let's look at South, those are the Taino Towers I believe in Harlem. After all that investment in glory of the era, we, we see what sometimes our society values. There was a big effort. There was petitions, demonstrations, coalitions. Um, the castle on the concourse, it was known as. And unfortunately, the, you know, the, the board president was convinced to ask for a new RFP for the building to see if it could be salvaged um, and repaired, which we everybody knew it could. Um, the petition did get him to become more supportive of uh, adaptive reuse of the space. Um, but unfortunately, um, as you saw, the demolition occurred. And uh, then it was upzoned to, to, you know, to enhance the development rights and density, um, as we hear a lot of these days. And uh, look, looking forward oh to this, <laughs> which could be anywhere. So, uh, my apologies, Edwin Torres couldn't be here to give more of a flavor for his impressionistic approach to a valuable resource that has been lost forever 
despite some efforts. And so um, that's a great segue to a transformative tale um, of PS 186 in Harlem. So um, Joseph Atonk, if you can come up and introduce yourself and tell us about this wonderful project. Uh, our firm was engaged by the Nod County uh, Construction Company uh, to be the designers for uh, the uh, conversion of uh, School 186 to a residential complex. So I'm going to go through just some uh, brief, uh, brief initial slides for some information those of you that may not know uh, where the school is located. And then Tom is going to really explain uh, sort of the development side of this project and sort of where we started and where we ended up, uh, which I think is a very interesting detail. And I will continue to uh, give you some uh, more uh, uh, views of the transformation that happened to that chart point in the sense. So the project is uh, located on 145th Street, and 145th Street is a major uh, east-west thoroughfare, and uh, it's really located very well for, for public transportation. It is on the subway lines and uh, you know, bus lines. It's in the community of West Harlem, and um, it has a number of, uh, of cultural um, sites as well as uh, parks. Uh, near, about half a block away, there is uh, the Hamilton Heights uh, branch of the New York Public Library. Uh, the parks nearby are Riverside Park, we have St. Nicholas Park, and also Riverbank Park. Um, so it, it's kind of surrounded by uh, various also uh, cultural institutions. Um, and uh, in order to kind of share, there's been some discussion already about the time period of uh, the turn of the century with the large uh, numbers of immigrants that came uh, particularly to New York and the amount of uh, growth and uh, building of residential areas. And the photograph on the right is actually inside Public School 186 where the uh, first floor is, and it really is showing a gathering of uh, immigrants in, uh, that uh, were settled in the area, um, and that are a part of this uh, community. The uh, photo on the left is an old photo of um, Broadway as you look sort of uptown, and that photo just shows the degree of uh, residential development that already had been established with uh, a certain number of apartment buildings and uh, sort of the timing of the public transportation system to the rest of the city. Um, the area is also known for some really beautiful uh, tree lined uh, residential um, buildings um, and uh, also uh, south of, uh, of the Florida School, uh, there's the uh, iconic uh, Apollo Theater. Where it was the center of uh, African American uh, entertainment venue and uh, sort of captured a, a, a piece of set the center for uh, that neighborhood. Uh, we, uh, the building itself uh, is between Broadway and Amsterdam Avenue. It is uh, one of the H plans by uh, Snyder. Um, it's, it's in the middle of the block, so it's a true lot. Uh, which gave the opportunity to create a, uh, two courtyards, which are generally elevated from the street elevation. Um, the uh, photo on the right is uh, a slightly later photo. I'm not sure something I think in the neighborhood contributed this photo to uh, our uh, documentation. But it's a 1942 uh, photograph that kind of shows you the continued change in the diversity of uh, people in that community and um, basically uh, um, this is probably around 1942 uh, vintage 
Um, the uh, actual school was designed in an Italian uh, so Renaissance style. It was uh, five stories. It had an incredible prominent uh, cornice, um, and the building was uh, uh, finished off with uh, decorative terracotta units at the uh, window openings. Uh, and the lower uh, base of the school had cast stone as its uh, primary material. And here you can see um, the, uh, the courtyard uh, kind of full of students. And uh, the uh, history of it is that the school became uh, immediately filled to capacity just about with it. And I've opened this. This is a 1903 uh, photograph uh, that we have in documentation. Um, the, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Tom, who's going to talk a little bit more about the adaptive and use um, tale or story. So my name is Tom Sion, and I work for Manadnock Development. Manadnock is one of three development partners on the project. So Manadnock Development, um, Atlantic Community Development and the Boys and Girls Club of Fun were the three partners working on it. And that uh, construction also built or renovated the building. So there were two parts of the company I worked for that worked on the project. Um, I'd like to say that, or with this group in particular, that we had this vision of saving the building from the very beginning and we appreciated Snyder's work, but that's not exactly how it happened. <laughs> um, the Boys and Girls Club of Harlem had bought the building in 1985 or 86 from the city of New York for about $300,000. And it sat empty from 1985 to uh, 2006 when they, they didn't really have a plan all those years. They didn't have resources. And so they let out an RFP to have someone come in and develop the building um, and which would generate enough funding to uh, help them build out a 50,000 square foot Boys and Girls Club. So just to give you some scale, the, the entire building is 100,000 square feet now. So what you see here is 100,000 square feet. They wanted a Boys and Girls Club that would take up half of that space. So I entered this RFP process with a colleague of mine and actually won. Um, and our plan was not yeah. to save the building. We, we couldn't. They, they also had another requirement of um, building a regulation basketball court in the club. And I can't remember what those dimensions are, but there was no way of fitting it into the building. You couldn't fit it into the courtyard, you couldn't put it in the building, and we also needed to build a big enough building that would throw off enough funding to support the building of the club, that huge club. So we proposed to tear down the building, build a tower on each street, and sink the, the basketball court between the two towers. And these towers are 15 stories, not 30. We did have some perspective. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we, uh, we made this proposal. It was a great proposal. It was all going to be affordable, cooperative apartments for low-income people, um, and we were trying to promote it as a home ownership effort using the city's um, Housing Development Corporation bonding uh, to help us do it. And um, so we went into the community to get it approved. And as you can imagine, the community hated the idea, as did all the other people that lost to us. <laughs> and um, it was a terrible process. Um, and I actually stood up and got yelled at by the community for months and months and months and got it approved. Um, after that time, the Boys and Girls Club was reevaluating um, what they wanted to get out of it in addition to this 50,000 square foot club. And they wanted to more money to support and endow the club, which we had a hard time coming up with the money for the 50,000 square feet. We couldn't come up with more money for them and still develop it. So they, eventually, they kind of left us and brought in another developer who promised to do 
do what they wanted. Um, and they still wanted us involved, but they wanted someone else to take the lead. And then the economy tanked in 2008. And I moved to LA, and um, the developer struggled to try to figure out how to do it. The funding that we were going to use wasn't available anymore. No one was buying anything. And so, ironically, um, I came back from LA, and I settled in at Monadnock with my colleague, who I had worked with. We both came to Monadnock, and our future partner came to Monadnock and said, will you help us finish this building? So in 2011, we joined forces again on the building, and so that's when Monadnock Development and the Community Development of Boys and Girls Club came together as a group. We realized that, uh, we actually, I think we presented to the city, a, and by that time they had moved to Datner, so I would like to say I knew Datner was the right firm all along for it, but I had actually gone to someone else. It was only later after kissing some other frogs that we found Datner. <laughs> <laughs> we were very happy we did. Um, so we came back together as a group, brought the, um, more like a tower scheme that even Datner was involved with, to the city, HPD, and they said, go back to the drawing board because you're asking for too much money. So we went back, literally went back to the drawing board, and, and the best way to develop the building was to preserve it and to, to seek state and federal um, historic tax credits to do that. And based on what the cost of the renovation would be and what the city would support, we were able, we, we are hopefully going to generate 11 million in uh, state and federal tax credits. And that filled our gap. So the eventual renovation was more expensive than it might otherwise have been because we were required to preserve all these details in the building that might have been lost. Uh, but um, we figured that was the right way to do it and, and came to our senses. And, um, that was already involved, but asked them to go back to the drawing board and start with a preservation scheme. And that was 2011 into 2012. Uh, as you can see in the image that's up, uh, the original image uh, all the way on the left, the middle image it was what we were working with at the time, and the one on the right is actually like a couple weeks ago. Um, it's not yet done, almost done. Um, we enlisted a large firm that does preservation consulting to help us through the stages of preservation office SHPO uh, requirements. Um, the first of which is a part one application where you pitch your idea for preserving it. Um, ultimately, the state and the federal government have to approve your plan and they give you a part one approval. But we got a conditional approval uh, on our part one which they had never really done before. And that was because they found that there was so little on the outside that you could preserve, as you can see, so that they gave us an approval on the interior of the building only. So basically, in the writing on the, the condi conditional approval, it says, basically, don't mess up the inside. Uh, that was the spirit of it. So we worked with a firm, and we had plans to do the, uh, the exterior and to improve and preserve the exterior, but we weren't getting credit for it. And after a couple eff efforts to um, develop a plan, we got another consultant to help us because we weren't having success with the first one. And we went back to uh, the state SHPO office and said, why are you giving us credit for the outside of the building? We're gonna put on new corners, we're putting new windows on, we're completely preserving the facade, we need to get some credit. And the reason that's important is you have to finish your renovation, you have to then get to put in a part three, you have to get that approved and get the building on the National Register for historic places. And only after it's on the National Register are you eligible for the 11 million in tax credits that we needed. So we took it very seriously. We needed to have the credit for the outside. And we went back with this consultant and said, we're doing the cornice, we're doing windows, we're changing the facade. I mean, 
restoring the facade. And they loved the idea. Uh, so we had a part two approved, and I'll, I'll transition to Joe, but what, basically what they said is there are character-defining features on the building that you must preserve, and those are things that Joe and his colleagues carefully um, designed for us. But uh, entrances, um, ornamental stairs inside, trim, the circulation pattern that's in the shape, ceiling heights, windows. So that those were our marching orders. That was our commitment, and they approved it and we put the funding in place in, um, two years ago. So uh, that's uh, 14. Uh, we closed in June 14. Uh, we hoped to be done in June. Uh, 16, we're close. Um, we have 78 residential units. Um, the building, we have temporary certificates of occupancy for the residential portion. Um, I, I want to mention again, I don't want to give it to you. Uh, our partner, uh, one of our commitments to our partners was that we built a Boys and Girls Club, 10,000 square foot Boys and Girls Club. 10,000 down from 50,000. Um, and so the, that club is being finished up now, and we'll get a temporary certificate of occupancy in a week or so on that. And uh, we're going to have a grand opening on October 20th. And um, so it is actually a success story. So, <coughs> anyway, so we'll get that. So just to uh, give you an idea of what the transformation felt for us, because these are the conditions of the building when we started. So you can see the, the roof is practically all gone and we have no corners. The building has been exposed to weather, there's no windows, uh, it has graffiti, it has you know, all the deterioration of pretty nearly four decades. <laughs> Um, and um, that deterioration not only was on the outside, but of course was also on the inside. The weather had gone, uh, since the roof was uh, collapsed in many areas, uh, the weather had totally uh, brought in. And you can see trees growing, as was mentioned. Um, the um, photograph on the left is actually one of the uh, elements that Shipova wanted us to preserve, which is near the Minerva entrance that we talked about, there was this stairway that would lead up to the administrative and uh, the principal's office. Uh, so we managed to uh, conserve and preserve that. Um, and the right is just uh, the fifth floor. It uh, had a small gymnasium space. Um, and there were some skylights up there, but you can see a bunch of trees going through mm -hmm. the um, The photographs below are on the um, the one on the left is actually on the fourth floor, which was the auditorium. And this also had one of these uh, flexible uh, door track systems that you can close off uh, the space and subdivide it. I think it was about in three different ways. And it's a little bit darker. Facing that was the uh, principal's platform of uh, the school. And that was also one of the elements that was identified that we should try to preserve on the spiral project. And then just briefly to go through the existing plan that had uh, to show the main entrances to the school uh, were through the courtyards, that's sort of how the school was being used. The darker blue area was an, uh, an open play area. The, uh, the photograph that shows that track was just about in the middle of that space so that there's, I believe, uh, 10 a series of movable doors that could easily close off that space and divide it into sort of the north side and the south side. Um, and then the Minerva entrances uh, all the way at the bottom right uh, that led to that uh, stair, uh, that was the stair. The rest of the floor uh, had some workshops and some classrooms uh, in, in the original scheme. So how do we convert it? We, I uh, like the idea of preserving the entrances through the courtyard. So on the north side of the building, we created a, the a entrance for the uh, residences. Um, you can see a cluster of apartments on that. And on the south side, 
So given the Boys and Girls Club, a very central location, um, we find the uh, 10,000 square feet of possible space for the club. And they have a very large uh, multi-purpose room in that space, as well as some activity spaces that are for different age children. And then on the right hand side of the court plan, the recent uh, administrative area. We also gave them a separate uh, entrance, uh, the Minerva entrance for the administrative area that was in Rose Park. They, both the north and south side were uh, adapted for handicap accessibility, and the north side were able to uh, <coughs> some steps there originally, but they were in terrible condition, so we were able to just slope and it was very gradual right up to the main entrance at the, uh, the residential side. And on the south side, we have an entrance that goes through the uh, pedestal area of the building. It's to be here um, not only because I, we are residents, but I am also a parent and a teacher. So I feel that in the capacity of all three of those, uh, my experience of being at PS109 is unique, and I therefore daily feel grateful for what has happened and how this building has become a part of the East Harlem Aquarium community. I, I'll get up my I'll get up myself. Thank you. I'll get up myself. Thank you. So our building is located on 99th Street between Second and Third Avenue uh, in East Harlem, uh, where I moved to in 2006. Um, as you can see, no, just kidding, you can't see that. Um, moving to East Holland for me was really exciting. I'm originally from De Denmark, um, and coming from Europe and moving to New York, I, I've lived everywhere, I lived in Brooklyn, Bay Ridge, and, uh, and then I moved to East Harlem in 2006, and uh, quickly fell in love with what is now my home, where my children are born, and a proud El Barrio resident. Um, there's lots of things about East, East Harlem. I don't know if you've been there, if you haven't, you should come. We're super friendly. Um, and we have a lot to offer, not least our uh, amazing artistic community, our, our food, uh, the life, the music. It's, uh, in some ways, when I came down here today, I was like, oh, it's like, East Harlem, but lower. <laughs> so it's really wonderful. It, it feels like being at home. Uh, but I am now, uh, like I said, uh, a 10-year resident, and I'm going to pass over to Evelyn, who's been around a little longer, though not quite that long. <laughs> well, I'm not a parent, but um, I'm, I live at PS109. I've been associated or affiliated, connected to a barrio since I was very, very young. The fact that my father was a uh, business person, and he had a Ramirez Travel located on Lexington between 116th and 115th Street. So I remember going to a barrio since I was like in grammar school. Uh, I lived in the other side of the park. But uh, after years after, my connection to a barrio started in the late 70s. And as everybody knows, the late 70s was the emergence of a lot of things that were happening here in this city the cultural explosion so so that's where I, when I really got to get plugged in more uh, having uh, working there and then meeting the people who live in the neighborhood and it just grew and developed and then finally I'm again living in, in Bajio on 99th Street between 2nd and 3rd in this wonderful building that we're all very very blessed to be in I also have to sh give a shout out to Nancy, who's in the audience, who's also a resident uh, of PS109, and thank you for being here this evening and supporting us. These are just uh, some, some pictures uh, that are fascinating. I especially just want to draw your attention to the difference between the picture on the left is actually PS109, uh, which is at that point surrounded by ten other buildings, and this of course is PS9 with nothing around it. So you just see it, the changes in New York City um, are just incredibly fascinating. That's 99th Street going there. Um, we're really curious about this right there, that. 
it's not there anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is, but it is an architect available after we can talk about what it might have been. Um, I don't the L. The L. It's the L. Yeah. 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 Well, there you go. <laughs> we were just had this little image here. Yeah, it's tiny. Also, at that time, PS109 was bounded on either side and across the street by tenements. And right now, um, to the north and to the south, we are surrounded by the Washington Lexington NYCHA housing units. I don't have the exact number, but I think there's about somewhere between 10 and 12 buildings um, on both sides of us. So those tenements are no longer there. So we went from this to this. How did that happen? Uh, well, it was a functioning school. PS1 was a functioning school until um, the 90s. And at this point, it, a process begins uh, in East Harlem uh, where, and it's a long process, um, so it really doesn't begin to come to fruition until 2004. Um, but as you saw, art space was almost involved with another building, then that ended up not happening. Art space is a national institution um, that re restores spaces and makes it affordable housing for artists. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later about the, the process for how artists get into the building. But um, they are approached and they partner with uh, Operation Fight Back uh, in East Harlem, supported by the Bloomberg administration. Uh, over a long period of time, lots of funding used to be, it was going to be 70 units and I mean 90 units, or 91, I guess we put it in 60, 90. Um, and funding rose and fell, um, but, and, and of course there was many ideas about what was going to happen uh, to this building because the uh, local residents, a lot of them would like it to see it return to a school. Um, which is completely understandable. Uh, a lot of people uh, were very much against uh, the idea of, of art space coming in and taking over. Um, it, en it ended up being what happened. It is one option. It could have been many things. And I think it's just important to say that we recognize as residents there are many things that could have happened. Um, but one of the things that we strive to, and I think Nancy can speak to this too, is to make sure that the community is as involved in the events that happen at PS109 today. So it's been really important to draw the community in as much as, as, much as we can. Um, so it was, um, as you can see, it wasn't as run down as some of the other buildings that we've seen on the outside. Um, although, of course, extensive, extensive construction uh, took place. We have a couple of photographs. We don't know where that is in the building exactly. <laughs> it's hard to tell. Um, but I was I was in there at a point that it didn't look like this, um, but you could still kind of see the work that had gone into to having to <coughs> restore um, those big windows. Yeah, it's funny. The hallway still or the stairways still sort of look like that, just nicer. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, to, to, so in, impressed about the reconstruction efforts and the preservation efforts is really, it does look like that. It's, I mean, it's, it's the same banister reel, I swear to God. My son learned to walk on that banister reel. Um, and that's just a really wonderful thing to see. Um, the spire had to be taken off and put back on. Uh, because of the condition of it. We've heard that much of the fifth floor was destroyed, right? The roof. Um, it was pretty bad condition, so the fifth floor was completely done. Which is where the old gym was, actually, in the building. It was right. on the fifth floor. Um, and it, I didn't see it, but apparently it was quite an event, and they placed that back up. You can't really see the scale of it, but it's quite an impressive spire. Come visit, we'll show you. Mm -hmm. um, I've heard a rumor you can get up into it. Have you been there? <laughs> um, this is some images of what the what it looks like presently. Um, one of our tenants, that's Adekar, with their lovely child Numa and his lovely wife Jamila, both artists. Um, and on the bottom left is one of the spaces before it was, you know, um, inhabited by, I don't know exactly whose apartment that is at the moment. And on the right is 
can you see in the background? I don't know if that's it's Jude. Jude, my mm -hmm. son. One of her <laughs> twins, and that's just well on that line. Um, the hallway is very long. It's like a bowling alley. Right? <laughs> you could set up a bowling alley in, in that space. Uh, but that just talks about how beautiful they uh, refurbished uh, the spaces. You know, when you look at the slides, you look at the slides and see the deterioration and what it looks like now. It's like it's gorgeous. So when the lottery opened. Um, it was open, I mean, it's actually open across the country, but preference was given to uh, existing community members and community board 11 uh, and artists. Um, and what's wonderful to me about that process is there was no, it was a peer evaluation, but there was no judgment on what art meant. what it was previously known for, um, was part of uh, Snyder's innovative uh, age plan that uh, previous uh, presenters um, talked about um, how it was so efficient to provide light and air to classrooms uh, in schools built on mid-block uh, sites. Um, are we getting? Okay. So that's an image of the school we, we don't have original images of the school when it wasn't abandoned. So at least this is the part when it was abandoned closer to, to the, you know, to the, to the point in 2001. Um, additionally, this, this building, this structure, uh, is one of the first and the oldest, that has the oldest existing elementary school. It's the oldest existing elementary school to include an auditorium with direct access from the street. So it, it automatically uh, uh, made it perfect to, to be a community center. It's like just thinking about that beforehand. You know, this innovation was int introduced by Snyder in 1903 and allowed schools to function as community centers. Let's let's go into the what happened in the transition. It, it operated till uh, the late 70s and as part of you know the the general wave of. Uh, closures of uh, because the city was disinvested um, the Department of Education de decided to close it right in mid, mid seventies in, in uh, the mid yeah seventy five seventy four uh, so so it was in the mid seventies and um, just that as it had served as a center of education and acculturation for a lot of European immigrants of the earlier uh, earlier twentieth century this building was adapted to the needs of uh, a new generation of immigrants. So what I think is interesting uh, as an overall view is that we, we've seen the preservation um, stories of, of the, the previous presenters in terms of the physicality of the structure. What in this case, what, ha what managed to happen is that the preservation didn't necessarily happen in the physical sense because they didn't, in the 70s, we were not, you know, the Puerto Rican Latino community in this neighborhood was not counted with great architects and funding, but they did manage to preserve the content, what, was the, what the building was supposed to serve, that community spirit, and that's what we're going to go into, even though it was through the model of sweat equity, not great architects. <laughs> so, um, Chino Garcia, I'm proud to be beside him, this legendary figure. And uh, basically, he was one of the pivotal play players in all this. Maybe you can talk to us about the, the players, which was you, the, the, what became Charas, and the other players, and that transition from abandoned school to the vision that enlivened it. Well, basically, when the, the reason it was closed back in the 70s, um, it's because New York City was going through financial crisis, really serious financial crisis where the cashiers and banks didn't want to cash the workers' checks. It was that bad, it was sad for a worker to receive a check from the city and, and, and he or she couldn't catch it. You know, that was how bad it was. Uh, New York City went broke, period. So one of the things they did in order to get out of the financial crisis is to close a whole bunch of buildings. The Lower East Side, they close around four schools. 
in the Lower East Side of Block 5. I can't remember the details. Scattered throughout the Lower East Side, not just in one area. So anyway, um, at the, when that happened, immediately uh, about the building and Chavez, we went to the Board of Education and requested that they turn over the building to the community immediately. And through bureaucratic systems, of course, you know, the, you, you all know how the city works. You know, it took us almost four years to negotiate details. Finally, by that time, the building was being vandalized. Um, tremendous amount of precious metal that was inside that building, copper, the entire building around, uh, or, at the, but, or anyway, oh. the, the entire building of the H frame, which is huge, um, almost uh, each, that one floor, the roof is around 11,000 square feet. If you notice, somebody else mentioned the age building, a lot of them mostly was around 100,000 square feet. You know, they mostly all had the same amount of measurements of the age design buildings. Anyway, so that copper was purchased copper. You know, it wasn't to, uh, we got it. Or it was expensive. But we did it all the way to the fifth floor with putting electricity. And basically, when we started working on the building, um, the main thing is, is to just restore it. You know, no renovation, no 